Wednesday to the Bible studies, I've been going through the book of Isaiah, and uh, the last one we did was chapter 14. I said I'm not going to do every chapter in Isaiah, and I was scheduled to do Isaiah 17 this Wednesday, but I thought in view of uh, certain events taking place in the Middle East and uh, its relevance, we might look at it tonight. Also, I'm going to read some verses from Isaiah 25. Isaiah 17. Let's have a word of prayer as we come to the Word of God. Lord, we thank you for your word. Pray that you guide us as we look at it, and may we learn from it uh, truths that you'd have us to learn. Pray you help me as I speak on this subject, and guide me by your Holy Spirit. May your name be glorified, and your truth be heard, we pray. In the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 17, verse 1. The burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aroa are forsaken, they will be for flocks which lie down, and no one will make them afraid. The fortress will also cease from Ephraim, the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They will be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord of hosts. In that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob will wane, and the fatness of his flesh grow lean. It shall be as when the harvester gathers the grain and reaps the heads with his arm. It shall be as he who gathers heads of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes will be left in it, like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives at the top of the uttermost bough, four or five in its most fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. In that day a man will look to his maker, and the eyes, his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands, he will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden images, nor the incense altars. In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bough, and as an, up, an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel. And there will be desolation, because you've forgotten the Lord God of your salvation, and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. Therefore you will plant pleasant plants and set out foreign seedlings. In that day you will make your plant to grow, and in the morning you will make your seed to flourish, and the harvest will be a heap of ruins in the day of grief and desperate sorrow. Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of seas, and to the rushing of the nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Then behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. And just a few verses from chapter 25. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. You have made a city a ruin, a fortified city a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore the strong people will glorify you, the city of the terrible nations will fear you, for you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. You will reduce the noise of the aliens, and as heat in a dry place, as heat in the shadow of a cloud. The song of the terrible ones will be diminished, and in this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice plate pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. He will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering, cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. He will rebuke the rebuke of his people. He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We've waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Praise the Lord. Uh, I was reading that uh, a poll was carried out in the United States uh, just uh, recently by Barna Group, which is a research group focusing on matters relating to faith. And it found that more than four out of ten individuals over the age of 18 believe that, quote, the world is currently living in the end times as described by prophecies in the Bible. Uh, That's four out of ten. That's quite a large number. In fact, in my latest, uh, my edition of the What's the World Heading For, we put uh, another survey which said that there were seven out of ten people who believe we're living in the last days. So America, they obviously go down a bit. In fact, 54% of Protestants believe we're living in the last days and the majority of evangelicals, at 77%, uh, believe we are living in the last days. 
Uh, one thing which makes people think we are living in the end times is the uh, Middle East situation. Israel back in the land, surrounded by nations in great turmoil, uh, the great powers involved, uh, potential use of weapons of mass destruction, Jerusalem as the burdensome stone, and so on. And over the last month, uh, Syria and Damascus have been the focal point of world attention. And as I said, we were going to look at Isaiah 17 on Wednesday, but I thought we might look at it today, because it has a little bit to say about this subject. There's a little map of the area, just so we know where we're talking about. Um, as we're aware, there's been a terrible civil war raging over Syria for the last two and a half years. Over 100,000 people killed, over a million made refugees in surrounding countries, and perhaps as many as 2.5 million people displaced within Syria. Uh, it's actually the worst humanitarian crisis in the world for a, a long time. And this uh, horror was increased on August the 21st, when over 1,400 people were killed in the eastern suburbs of Damascus, um, by chemical weapons, allegedly fired by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, reports of this massacre were beamed around the world with photos of videos showing scores of dead civilians, including children. Um, the Assad regime, of course, denied that it fired the missiles, and some said it was a false fire attack um, planted by the rebels uh, who used chemical munitions, which had been supplied, uh, there is reports they've been supplied by Saudi Arabia, which has its own reasons for wanting to get rid of uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, <coughs> and that was deliberately used to draw in a response from the United States because of crossing the red lines which Mr. Obama, President Obama, had set on using chemical weapons. Um, just to put you in the picture about Saudi Arabia, Saudi is against, uh, which you find down here, is against the Assad regime in Syria because it's the Assad regime is linked up with Iran and uh, for reasons of Islam and other reasons, they are hostile to the Assad regime. Uh, it's, in fact, it is becoming almost a war between Sunni and Shiite Muslims, uh, Saudi being basing Sunni, Iran being Shiite. Uh, the Syrians actually are not really proper Shiite. The Assad regime isn't actually properly a Shiite regime. It's uh, a secular regime. Assad himself is from a group called the Alawites, who are a branch of Shiite Muslims. Uh, some people think they're... Uh, Sunnis actually regard them as being heretics as far as Islam is concerned. I'm told they even keep Christmas, and they have some sort of links with in Christian influences as well. But they're not strictly Shiite Muslims. But the Assad regime is allied to Iran, and Saudi Arabia is against uh, the alignment with, with Iran and wants to actually break it. And so they've been supplying the rebels against Assad with weapons which they can use against him. Um, the great powers are also involved, including Russia and the United States. Um, Russia has its involvement with Syria already, which wants to have its, uh, already has a port facility in the north of Syria. Um, read that Russia is actually very keen that a pipeline, which has been planned by Qatar, shouldn't go through Syria, through to Turkey, up to Europe, which would then undercut their um, gas supplies to Europe, and they want to prevent this from happening, and that's, they're putting pressure on uh, they, Assad won't let that happen, so they want to keep Assad in power so that uh, that won't happen. And there are all kinds of superpower power plays going on behind the scenes. It would take me too long to describe it, but it's clear that this is not just a straightforward spat between two different groups of people within the country. Um, <clears throat> going back to what's happened, following the chemical attack, President Obama said that Syria had crossed its red lines by using chemical weapons and declared that the regime must be punished. At the beginning of September, as we know, the scene was set for, appeared to be set for a U.S. missile strike on Syria. Uh, the momentum towards this was delayed after the British Parliament voted against Britain being involved. Uh, President Obama then decided to seek approval for this missile strike from Congress. The president hasn't been given. At the time of writing this article, he, or writing this talk, he's put military uh, action against Syria on hold in order to pursue diplomacy. Uh, and the present situation is that the, with the Russians, they, are, they have just, in fact, announced a deal today uh, that uh, Assad will give up his chemical weapons, and the deal goes that he must give up um, his chemical weapons within... He must give a comprehensive list within one week of where his chemical weapons are um, and give inspectors immediate unfettered access to all sites... All weapons must be destroyed, including the possibility of removing weapons from the Syrian territory. 
and the UN will provide logistical support and compliance which should be enforced under Chapter 7, which means that they'll have the use of force if necessary at the last resort. Uh, latest news is that Syria has accepted this deal. Uh, its foreign minister said on the one hand it helps Syria come out of the crisis, on the other it helps avoid the war against Syria, depriving those who want to launch it of arguments to do so. Thanks to our Russian friends for help, victory achieved for Syria, thanks to Russia. Uh, the Syrian opposition apparently is dismayed at the deal and they uh, hope that a US strike would give them cover to take on the regime and to take Damascus. Uh, the Gulf states who also support the opposition against Assad are also displeased. Uh, so is this the end of the matter? Well, not quite because the war is still dragging on and the possibility of some event uh, taking place to stop the deal is still on the agenda. Reading an article on the internet which talked about the rebels actually using chemical weapons they have to launch against Israel and then looking like it came from the Syrian government which in turn causes Israel to attack Syria. That's just talk but it's not the kind of thing people are speculating on. Uh, what is for sure is that prior to the last deal, um, Russia, which supported the Assad regime, warned that any direct attack on Syria from America would be like lighting the fuse to a powder cake. Both Russia and America have moved warships into the eastern Mediterranean. A senior official from the Syrian army warned the United States, quote, if Damascus comes under attack, Tel Aviv will be targeted too, and a full-scale war against Syria will actually issue a license for attacking Israel. Iran also threatened to launch a massive missile strike against Israel if the U.S. attacks Syria for using chemical weapons against its own people, which could touch off a full-blown war in the region. If anything this, like this were to happen, you could be sure that Israel would respond by attacking Syria. Israel's Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, Chairman Avidor Lieberman, said on Monday, <coughs> Israel will ensure that leader, Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad will not remain in power if he attacks Israel. This statement was the clearest warning to Assad delivered by a top Israeli figure since the escalation of tension between Syria and the United States. Uh, he said, the supreme Israeli interest is to remain outside the conflict. There are many figures trying to drag us in. We've successfully avoided that, and we should continue to do so in the future. That's why Bashar al-Assad's threats in various media outlets to expand the conflict to neighboring countries bother me. Israel has no interest, will, or intention to take part in the Syrian civil war but Assad must understand in the clearest possible way that if he and his regime do not leave us a choice and he attacks Israel or transfers chemical weapons to Hezbollah, Israel will re respond in the harshest way, including toppling his regime. If a single chemical warhead falls on an Israeli city, and if the Israelis believe Assad is responsible, they will absolutely flatten Damascus, which could start off a regional war in the Middle East. Some have even talked about World War III. Uh, well, with all that in mind, <coughs> Channel 4 News on Tuesday, I don't know if anyone watched it, I had a report um, on Muslims and Christians who believe the events in Syria are a sign of the approaching apocalypse. Uh, it featured Pat Robertson and other Christians, preachers, quoting Isaiah 17.1, Damascus shall be a ruinous heap, and saying that this prophecy is about to be fulfilled and will set off the apocalypse leading to the second coming of Christ. Uh, also featured Muslims saying that Syria is the epicenter of history as far as Islam, from a Muslim point of view, the place where the Muslim conquest began and where it will end. But Damascus was set up as a, uh, the calif first caliphate of Islam uh, following the Muslim conquest of the Arab countries. Showed a large number of foreign jihadis who were being encouraged to go to Syria and fight to bring liberation to Syria. Many of those are looking for the coming of the Mahdi, the Islamic saviour who, according to Muslim belief, will appear at the end of days along with Jesus and uh, looking for the return of Jesus. So did you know that the Muslims believe in the return of Jesus? Uh, <clears throat> might be surprised about that, but it's in fact the hadith of Islam, um, according to hadith in, which is the sayings of Islam, there's one which says that Allah will send the Messiah, son of Mary, i.e. Jesus or Isa as they call him, who would ascend at the white minaret on the eastern side of Damascus, wearing two garments, lightly dyed with saffron, his hands resting on the wings of two angels. When he lowers his head, beads of perspiration will fall from it. When he raises it up, beads like pearls will scatter from it. Every non-believer who smells him will die, and his breath will reach as far as he is able to see. Um, Channel 4 actually had a Muslim commentator on this who said that uh, 
Quote, Jesus is a figure in our religion. He's going to bring all this together. Muslims, Jews, and Christians have this conflict, which is unnecessary. Jesus is going to come down and sort it all out among them, all on the side of the Muslims. Uh, what he didn't say was that the Muslim Esau is a completely different figure from the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Um, he's a Muslim prophet who, according to these sayings in Islam, will come back to the earth, to Damascus, make a pilgrimage to Mecca, institute Islamic law, convert the whole world to Islam, abolish Christianity, kill the Dajjal, which is a Muslim version of the Antichrist, and his followers, who just happen to be mainly Jews, so he's going to wipe out the Jews and the Christians, uh, marry and have children and die then 70, 40 years later. Uh, so the return of Jesus in Islam will mean the end of days and the Christians and the whole world being put in subjection to Islam. Um, so there are people actually believing this stuff, and <clears throat> the Muslim writings also say that he's going to descend at a time of battle, and he's going to descend to Damascus. So could it be that they're looking for a battle over Damascus to be the place where Jesus returns to? Um, they're also looking for the Mahdi to come and to lead them into this battle to bring the victory. Uh, there's one slight problem because um, the people who are looking for this on the anti-Assad side are Sunni Muslims who are looking for the Mahdi to come and to bring them the victory of Islam. Uh, but they're actually not fighting at the moment against Jews or Christians. They're fighting against other Muslims. And it just so happens those other Muslims are being joined, uh, the Assad regime is being joined by people from Lebanon and from Iran. And uh, although Assad himself is not particularly religious and is not really trying to bring any kind of religious regime to uh, Syria, certainly the Iranians who are backing him are. And they're looking for the last battle, which will also uh, bring the coming of the Mahdi, and they're looking for it to happen at the present time. Which leads me to the question, if the Mahdi should turn up, is he going to help the Sunnis to kill the Shiites, or the Shiites to kill the Sunnis, or is he going to help them to do the main thing which they should be doing, which is to kill the Jews and the Christians? But without being too flippant, it shows you that the whole thing is actually in confusion and is based on false prophecy and is uh, one of the reasons why the Middle East is actually such a festering heap of violence, oppression and instability at this present time uh, because of the Islamic fundamentalism, which is stirring up revolutions, which is stirring up strife between Muslims, and which is, in fact, is a sign of the second coming, but uh, the real second coming of Jesus, uh, in ways which you'll see in a moment. Uh, Islam is actually certainly not the solution. It's the opposite of the truth. It's the problem of the Middle East. And uh, one group I haven't mentioned is the Syrian Christians, who are being targeted actually by the Sunni Muslims, uh, the, is, is the, reb the rebels against Assad, uh, driven out of their homes, and uh, many of them being told to convert or die to, uh, convert to Islam or to die. And also in Egypt, the radical Islamists have brought terrible suffering on the Christians in Egypt. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about Islam is that it takes stories from the Bible and changes them, often with the direct opposite of what the Bible teaches. Uh, so you have stories about Jesus, but they're changed. And uh, we shouldn't be surprised that they take the account of the second coming of Jesus and change the event. Uh, then they say that the Christians have changed the books, uh, which is their explanation about why the what the Bible says, it conflicts with what the Quran says on many different subjects. Uh, of course, the Bible was written long before the Quran and long before these hadith, so I think you should go to the original source, not to one which comes later on. Uh, the Bible is very clear that the place to which Jesus will return is not Damascus, it's Jerusalem. He will come with his saints to the Mount of Olives outside Jerusalem at the time of battle over that city. And when he comes, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He certainly won't be in subjection to anybody, and he certainly won't make the world Islamic. In fact, it says he's going to abolish the idols, and I would say that he's going to abolish Islam and idolatrous forms of Christianity and all forms of religion which are contrary to the faith in Jesus the Messiah. And he's going to redeem Israel and bring them to know Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Uh, if Muslims want to be part of this, then they should repent of their sins and believe in Jesus as Savior, who died for everybody and who's coming back in power and glory. But uh, enough about Islam. What about what they said about the Bible? And what about the Damascus prophecy, which we read about in Isaiah chapter 17? Again, read the first verse, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. Um, we actually have been going through this section of Isaiah, and one of the things I've pointed out is that 
The whole passage from Isaiah 13 uh, through to 23 is a series of oracles concerning nations which surround Israel, including some which actually are about Israel and about Jerusalem. Uh, Babylon in chapters 13 and 14, Syria in chapter 14, Philistia in 14, Moab in chapters 15 and 16, Damascus and Samaria in chapter 17, Ethiopia in chapter 18, Egypt in chapters 19 and 20, Babylon in chapter 21, and Edom also, and Arabia in 21, Jerusalem in 22, and Tyre in 23. This section of Isaiah is followed by what we call the little apocalypse of Isaiah, which is chapters 24 to 27, which I read some verses from in chapter 25, which deals with the end-time judgments which fall on the world at the end of this age and the time of the Great Tribulation, which brings this age to a close and the Lord coming to set up his messianic kingdom. Uh, The passage I read from Isaiah 25 is actually a description of the messianic kingdom which the Messiah sets up. If you want to read chapter 24, I won't read it now, but it describes the earth being shaken, the earth lying polluted under its inhabitants, and the Lord coming to punish the world for its evil, and uh, (coughs) the earth coming to the brink of destruction, but God stepping in to save the earth. That was uh, chapter 24. Now, throughout this section of Isaiah, what you have to notice is that there are prophecies concerning events which are also near at hand as far as the prophet is concerned. So it's like you've got a telescope Sometimes he's focusing on the near, sometimes on the events far away. And sometimes it's actually within the same chapter he goes from the near to the far. In chapter 13, for example, the oracle against Babylon uh, describes the coming rise of Babylon. And in verse 17, it describes its fall to the Medes, uh, which was an event which is going to take place uh, about 150 years later or so, perhaps a bit more than that from Isaiah's time, uh, the time when the Medes and the Persians would destroy Babylon and take Babylon, which you read about in uh, Daniel chapter 5 and also in the later parts of Isaiah, again prophesied in the later chapters of Isaiah. Uh, It also prophesies events concerning Babylon and the day of the Lord, and the Old Testament, when it uses the word phrase, the day of the Lord, is describing the end of days. And in fact, if you look in Isaiah 14, you find it has, we'll just read that, but actually Isaiah Isaiah 13, verses 9 to 12, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both fierce, with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light, the sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make the mortal more than, more rare than a fine gold and a man more than a golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of their place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now that's very clearly a prophecy describing the end of days. Uh, Day of the Lord, sun and the moon being darkened, the earth being shaken, and the Lord coming to punish the wicked and to shake the earth. Uh, So again, if you go through Isaiah 13, 14, you see it goes from the near to the far and back again. Uh, Same, I would say, with the chapter we just looked at. And... uh, Now we look at Isaiah 17, a bit of an introduction. What does this prophecy refer to? Uh, One thing you should notice is, although the first verse is about Damascus, there's actually more in this chapter about Ephraim and the northern kingdom, northern part of Israel. So we'll come to that in a moment, but uh, just bear that in mind. Uh, Now there are basically, I'm going to give you three views, and the one which actually commends itself to me. Uh, the first view is that this is a prophecy which has already been fulfilled. Okay, Damascus was destroyed by the Assyrians in the year 732, not long after Isaiah gave this prophecy. Uh, the following verses, verses 4 to 11, say that in that day the glory of Jacob will wane and describe a calamity befalling Ephraim or Samaria, which is the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, with its cities being forsaken and made desolate says that this will lead to people looking to their maker uh, and they will understand that this calamity has happened. Verse 10, because you've forgotten the God of your salvation. If you go to 2 Kings chapter 17, you find it describes what happened historically to fulfill this uh, when the Assyrians invaded Samaria and took the people of the northern kingdom into captivity after they'd taken Damascus. And this event is actually seen as a judgment from God for the idolatry and sin of the northern kingdom of Israel. 
Okay, so we'll just read one or two verses out of that. Chapter 17 of Kings. Two Kings, that is. You'll find it on page 347. It says, The king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. The ninth year of Hoshea, king of Assyria, took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria, and he placed them in Halar by the Habor and the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. For it, so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had fe- feared other gods, and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord God had cast out before the children of Israel and of the kings of Is- Israel which they had made. Children of Israel secretly did things against the Lord their God, things which were not right. They built for them themselves high places in their cities, and from watchtower to fortified field, city. They set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill, under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them, and they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served the idols of which the Lord has said, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord had testified against Israel, against Judah, and by all his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your servants, and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but they stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenant, which he had made with their fathers, his testimonies, which they had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord God had charged them that they should not do like them. So they left the Lord God of the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves a molten image and two calves, made a wooden image, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And so it goes on and says how the Lord was angry with them and removed them from the land. Uh, So we have one view that this scripture was actually, Isaiah 17 is actually the fulfillment, uh, is fulfilled by that event taking place. Uh, Damascus fell first to the Assyrians. After that, they came in and took the north of Israel. You can see that Damascus is here to the north of Israel, so they just came down over what's now the border and took the north of Israel and took the northern kingdom into captivity. Uh, Now, some would say that's the end of the story. The prophecy has been fulfilled. Don't try and apply it to today. Uh, Now, others would say, and I would agree with them, that this has an end-time fulfillment as well yet to happen. Uh, One thing which you notice in verse 1 is that Damascus will cease from being a city. It will be a ruinous heap. If you follow through in Isaiah 25, it also speaks about places which will cease to be cities, cities which will be completely wiped off. They will not be cities anymore. You've made a city a ruin, verse 2 of 25, a fortified city a ruin, a palace of foreigners to be a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Uh, So here we have a prophecy which speaks about a time when Damascus... In specifically, Damascus will cease to be a city. Now, Damascus has been attacked and fallen several times in history, but it's never ceased to be a city. Um, it fell to the Assyrians, it fell to the Babylonians, it fell to Alexander the Great, fell later on to the Muslims, and the Muslims themselves had conflicts over it, and it has fallen many times, but it never ceased to be a city. In fact, it is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, with the history going back some four or 4,000 years or more. Mentioned in the earliest books of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 14 and 15, remember that Abraham had a servant who was Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham went up to fight against the kings who'd taken Lot into captivity, and he went past Damascus. So it's mentioned there right at the beginning, uh, in the days of Abraham, before Jerusalem's ever mentioned. So Damascus is there, a very old city. Uh, Joel Rosenberg says, these prophecies have not yet been fulfilled. Damascus is one of the oldest continuous inhabited cities on earth. It's been attacked, besieged, and conquered, but Damascus has never been completely destroyed and left uninhabited. Yet this is exactly what the Bible says will happen. The context of Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49 are a series of end-time prophecies dealing with God's judgment on Israel's neighbors and enemies leading up to and through the tribulation. Uh, So if that's the case, when is it going to happen? Uh, Any time now, according to some commentators. Uh, Rapture Ready website has an article which I read. um, I'll just paraphrase it. It relates Isaiah 17 to Psalm 83. Uh, We'll look at a few verses from Psalm 83 as also. Uh, (coughs) Ties this in with two coming, ties in these, these two into coming events. This is a summary of what this article says. 
The battle will move from being one between the rebels and the regime of Syria to one involving Israel. This could come as a result of U.S. missile strikes on Syria, provoking a Syrian attack on Israel, which in turn provokes an Israeli attack on Damascus. As a result, the city of Damascus will become a heap of ruins, utterly destroyed. In addition, many of the cities of northern Israel will also be destroyed, with poverty stalking the land as their cities are decimated, which is the passage we haven't really looked at, Isaiah 17, 4 to 11. Israel then faces an enemy invasion as their enemies view her suffering as an opportunity to invade their ultimate goal to destroy her forever. Verses 12 through to 14. However, God has a different plan in mind. He would destroy these invaders himself. This destruction of the enemies of Israel is related to Psalm 83, where the enemies of Israel, quote, devise crafty schemes against your people, laying plans against your precious ones, Come, they say, let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We will destroy the very memory of its existence. These enemies are listed as the Edomites, the Ishmaelites, Moabites, and Hagarites, Gebelites, Ammonites, Amalekites, people from Philistia and Tyre. Assyria has joined with them and is allied with the descendants of Lot. These nations can be identified with nations surrounding Israel. In Psalm 83, the psalmist calls upon the God to blow these nations away like the whirling dust, like chaff before the wind. If you look at Isaiah 17, verse 13, it says these nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like chaff of the mountains before the wind. So with the image of the chaff and the wind and the nations being blown away. This article goes on to say, thus God will defeat these armies and give Israel the opportunity to continue to dwell in the land and rebuild. This attack will be followed by the war of Gog and Magog prophesied in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38 to 39, an enormous coalition of nations, a vast and awesome horde will roll down on Israel like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. The leader of this nation is Gog from the land of Magog, which is situated to the uttermost north of Israel, i.e. Russia, and joined by a number of nations, including Persia, i.e. Iran. Both Russia and Iran are already involved in the Syrian conflict. This prophesied future war in Ezekiel also has many similarities to Isaiah 17, 12 to 14. Both prophets foresee a time when enemy armies rush towards the land while she awaits unprepared intent to plunder and destroy the people of Israel. Both prophets foresee God's destruction of Israel's enemies. These events will lead to the second coming of Christ and the end of this age. So, are you with me so far? <laughs> that's the case, then that means that these events could be imminent. Um, not so, say others, uh, including Thomas Ice, and if you may remember, Thomas Ice has been here to speak. Um, he actually says that the destruction of Damascus, when it ceases to be a city, will take place amidst the catastrophic events at the end of the tribulation, the end of the seven-year period of the Great Tribulation, just before Jesus returns. Uh, when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and brings this age to an, an end. Damascus is one of the hostile cities to Israel in the last days will be destroyed, not to be rebuilt during the Messianic Kingdom, age after Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives outside Jerusalem to take up his thousand-year reign over the earth from Jerusalem. Uh, see Zechariah 14 and Jeremiah, uh, Revelation 19 to 20 for that. So he says that it's not going to happen immediately, it's going to happen later at the end of the tribulation period. Uh, Joel Richardson, another person who I've read some articles by, he writes a, he's written a book called The Islamic Antichrist. Um, he also says that this event is going to happen at the end of the tribulation period. Um, and he points out, if you look at the verses 2 through to 3, it says the cities of Aroah will be forsaken and sovereignty will disappear from Damascus and the remnant of Aram. Uh, Aram actually speaks of the greater region of southern Syria, and biblical scholars say that the Bible atlases tell us that Aroa is a reference to the region of northern modern-day Jordan. This would include the capital city of Amman. Prophecy also refers to Ephraim and says that Ephraim will become virtually desolate. Uh, so where is Ephraim? Uh, Ephraim is the name given to the northern kingdom of Israel in the time when the nation was divided between the north and the south. Uh, which refers to the area of Samaria. So if we can take this as being something that's going to happen, uh, he says it's going to happen to the northern part of Israel. And he draws attention to verses 3 to 7, 
take some quotes from it. I'll just read what he says here, which are not the whole passage. He says, The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim. Now, on that day, the glory of Jacob will fade and the fatness of his flesh will become lean. Yet gleanings will be left in it like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives on the topmost bough, four or five on the branches of a fruitful tree, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. In that day, their strong cities will be like forsaken places in the forest or like branches which they abandoned before the sons of Israel. Their land will be a desolation. Beyond northern Israel, the text also declares that in that day, the glory of Jacob will fade. Jacob, of course, is simply a reference to all of Israel. So Israel's glory will fade to the point of being sparsely populated. Conclusion then, this passage is not speaking of an imminent attack of Damascus. Isaiah 17 is simply one of the pieces of the larger section of Isaiah's prophecy, which speak of judgment not only against Israel, but all her adversarial Gentile neighbors. When will this occur if one examines this larger portion of Isaiah's prophecy in its proper context? Rather than pulling out the verse, single verse here and there, it's clear that the ultimate context is the day of the Lord, the judgment against nations, and the return of Jesus. In other words, it's not imminent. You follow that? It's going to happen sometime in the future, the time at the end of the Great Tribulation period. Uh, if you look at all the relevant scriptures, I would agree actually with Joel Richardson here. Um, the destruction of Damascus, which is prophesied in Isaiah, comes at the same time as a devastating attack on Israel, described in Isaiah 17, which would tie up with the final stage of the Great Tribulation period. Now, the earlier writers said that Israel is going to recover from that and Israel will beat back her enemies and will actually then even occupy Arab countries round about. Personally, I don't see how that's going to happen. If Israel is actually invaded, cities destroyed, and this great invasion comes in, it would seem that it would be moving towards the, the end of Israel. Uh, now, other passages in the Bible would say that's going to happen. Yeah, there are, actually. It says there's going to be a battle called Armageddon. What is going to happen? It says the nations are going to gather together at Armageddon. Where is Armageddon? It's in Megiddo, which is in the north of Israel. So there'll be an invading army coming against Israel to the north. And without the intervention of God... The Lord coming in person, as he will at the last battle, according to Zechariah chapter 14, Israel would not survive such an attack. Nevertheless, until that time, Israel will survive. And that tells me that although the situation is threatening to Israel, I don't believe at this time Israel is going to be knocked out by uh, missiles from Damascus or from Iran. I believe that God will continue to protect Israel because there are still things which have to happen in God's purposes for Israel, including the peace settlement, uh, some would say a rebuilding of the temple uh, and also a uh, turning to the Lord amongst the people of Israel. So I believe that although the situation may look threatening at this present time, I don't believe actually at the present time we're going to see this devastating attack which is actually described here in Isaiah 17. That will come at the end of the age when the armies gather together at Armageddon. Arnold Fruchtemann actually points out that Armageddon is not the, is the marshalling lard place of the armies which then go down for the final battle which takes place at Jerusalem uh, or in the valley of Jehoshaphat outside Jerusalem uh, the place where Yeshua the Messiah returns to and comes back this time as king of kings and lord of lords with all power and glory at his, at his hands and brings this age to an end and that of course will be the end of this age, it will be the time when uh, the events which are described in chapter 25 of Isaiah, which I wanted to read just to show you there is a hopeful end to this. Uh, the Lord will come. The people will say that the terrible ones have fallen. And <clears throat> the Lord has been a strength the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm. Uh, verse 6, it says, The Lord will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines and on the lees of fat things full of marrows, well refined lines for Wines on the lees, he will destroy on this mountain the surface of covering cast over all people. Uh, which speaks about the kingdom feast which is going to take place at the beginning of the millennial reign of the Messiah. And as he gathers together all of the redeemed from all ages together uh, for the beginning of his thousand year reign. Uh, when the Lord will be the peace and deliverance of Israel. And in that day it says the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty for the remnant of his people. So the Lord will come and bring his peace, his justice to his nation. But in the meantime, we can expect there's going to be an increase of trouble. We, I believe we are living in the last days, and these things, although I've said that the destruction of Damascus may not be imminent, the coming of Christ for his church may be imminent. 
and Jesus can come at any time for his church. And we're seeing many signs which are pointing us towards the return of Jesus as the Savior. And the events in Syria themselves are lining up with the last day's prophecies of the Bible. So you see nation, conflicts between nations, kingdom against kingdom, uh, tribe against tribe, Sunni against Shiite, uh, uh, people against people, Saudi Arabia against Iran, all of them against Israel. We also see people being inspired to follow a false prophet, Muhammad, and bringing great evil and destruction in his name, uh, bringing persecution to those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Also fulfilling prophecies of Matthew 24 concerning the last days. Uh, we see false prophets and false messiahs. Certainly this idea of the Mahdi is another example of a false messiah, people looking for a false messiah to come and being deceived. Uh, we see people afraid of what's coming on the world as chemical weapons have been used and could fall into the hands of terrorists, as well as nuclear weapons being developed by Iran and the threat of conflict between nations. Also, it's interesting that Russia and America have been drawn into it, and now the UN, and you're seeing in one sense this kind of uh, world government settlement actually being put in place. We'll see whether it works or not, but it's like uh, the UN is functioning as that uh, world government, which we see is described for the last days of this age as well. So all of these things, I believe, are pointing us to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen... Panic and give up. No, he said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Uh, Jesus is coming. There is a hope for those who believe in him. And we should repent and believe the gospel, put our trust in Jesus as we see these things happening. Uh, he's coming to save those who believe in him and are born again of the Spirit. And we need to be ready for his return by accepting Jesus as our Savior. Uh, we should pray also for those who are caught up in these troubles and pray for Israel that they may be defended from attack from Syria uh, and from Iran and other nations which are hostile. Pray that Israel may look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son and recognize that Jesus is the Messiah who has come and is coming again in power and glory. But as we see these things happening, we do see the signs of the second coming of Christ and reasons why we should believe in the Lord Jesus. Uh, as I said, there could be conflict between Israel and Syria. I'm not saying that it won't be out of the question could be minor spats as we had with, relatively minor spats as they had with Hezbollah. But I don't think we'll see a devastating attack on Israel of the kind which is described in Isaiah 17 uh, until we come to the end of the age and the uh, conflicts of Gog and Magog and the Battle of Armageddon. But in the meantime, things are being prepared for that event. And the good news is that Jesus is coming. And in his day, he will put an end to all of this conflict and misery and wickedness and he'll bring his kingdom in which there'll be peace and justice and he's looking for those who will be on his side who'll be put their trust in jesus believe on the lord jesus christ for salvation and use the time that remains to share the good news that christ jesus is the messiah who has come who's coming again and who is the only answer to the problems of this world amen